by way of introduction, I want to say this is a uh, conversation between uh, Dr. Sheila Walker, um, the executive director of African Diaspora Documentary Film uh, Company, and uh, Howard Dodson, director emeritus of the Schomburg Center and uh, former director of the Moreland Spingarn Research Center. Um, our topic today is the uh, evolution, if you will, of the career and work of Dr. Sheila Walker. Um, and uh, I was just saying to a friend of ours that uh, as I thought about it, and it's not something that we generally admit in times like this, but um, we've actually known each other for the better part of 50 years. <laughs> I think it's about 50 years, and which is impossible because obviously both of us are just about 50, just getting on to 50 years of age. But here we are, and um, our, our agenda really is to have some conversations about uh, the life path that she's been on um, for not 50 years, but a long time. Very Well, actually, it's been about 50 years. <laughs> so uh, I wanted to start simply by asking you to uh, say a few things about your, um, you have stated elsewhere that you had your first um, trip to Africa and your first encounter with Africa as a, um, a life-changing experience um, at the age of 19. Uh, could you say a little bit more about that and, uh, and what, what about Africa that you saw that uh, was so seductive? Wow, well, thank you. I'd love to start there. And thank you so much for the introduction. And I guess we have known each other for a while and we have been on this very similar path for quite a while. And um, at some point we'll talk about how we about sort of the, the seminal moment at which our paths mixed and that got us to right here. But um, yeah, so I went to Cameroon when I was 19 with the experiment in international living. And um, I think I, I'm a cultural anthropologist and I think I started to become a cultural anthropologist when I was about four. Uh, I'm from New Jersey and <laughs> I knew that everything in the world was not in New Jersey. I was smart when I was four. Uh, <laughs> that, that's, that's not difficult to discover, but <laughs> even, even though I am a New Jersey resident. Go ahead. <laughs> that's right, right. Yeah, well, the, the great thing was that I had an aunt who lived in Chinatown in New York, my grandmother's sister. And we used to visit her on Sundays or Thursdays. And why Thursdays? Well, because she was a live-in maid for a rich Upper East Side white woman. And maids had Sundays and, what is it, Thursdays and every other Sunday off. That was an African-American social rhythm. So we would visit Aunt Irene and she didn't have kids and she didn't have a television. And so while the adults would talk about adult stuff, I would look out of her huge window onto Chatham Square and onto Mott Street. And I would see all these Chinese people. And I was fascinated by these people who looked different. And who, I mean, the whole environment was different. You know, there were pagoda roofs and those restaurants with the naked ducks hanging in the window by their necks. And I wonder, well, how do you eat that? So I was, you know, I was a curious kid and I hoped I would get a Chinese friend so I could go home with her and see how the Chinese people lived. And, you know, was the inside of their homes like what I saw on the streets. And I, unfortunately, I never got a Chinese friend, so I never found out. I was learning how to read and write, and I was looking for words I knew, um, alphabet letters that I knew, and I didn't see any of that. So this was like this whole mysterious world that I wanted to understand. And then on Chinese New Year's, they'd have dragons in the street. Wow. Now, Howard, you know there are no dragons in the street in Jersey, right? <laughs> So I wanted to go wherever these people came from. So if I'm a cultural anthropologist, it's thanks to the Chinese people in Chinatown. Um, but so, you know, I was four, right? So I couldn't go any place <laughs> that my parents didn't take me to. But when I went to college, I went to Bryn Mawr. And I was, <clears throat> as it was in those days, the colored girl in my class. 
and um, it wasn't awful. You know, people weren't mean. I was not a threat. I was just the lone colored girl. But I needed a little balance because I was from, you know, when I was where I was from in Jersey, we had a black community. So I was accustomed to my own community. We had no hostility toward the white people. Everybody was integrated. We went to school together, but parties were a black thing. And so uh, while in college, I managed to meet some Africans. So I managed to create a social life. And, um, and I wanted to go someplace, you know, China or someplace else, any place. And the opportunity at Bryn Mawr was, of course, France, you know, the height of civilization. So that was cool. I just wanted to go someplace. I, I applied to go to France, got accepted. Then I learned about the experiment in international living. And of course, at that time, the countries you could go to were mostly in Europe, but you could go to Cameroon. And so I immediately applied to go to Cameroon. And to make things more challenging, I was going to the French speaking part of Cameroon because Cameroon was divided <clears throat> by European colonization into French speakers and English speakers. So that was really gonna be pretty exciting. I knew about Africa, of course, cause I had watched television. So I knew that there was Tarzan and Tarzan was this bright white man who was more intelligent than all these Africans in their own environment. And um, that didn't bother me one way or the other. I just thought, wow, this is really different. I wanna go see. And so I wound up in the town of Fumban in Cameroon in the capital of the Bamoon kingdom. And it was absolutely nothing like what television told me about Tarzan. Uh, I lived in a nice house with, of course, hot and cold running water, of course, a couple of servants, of course, <laughs> just like Jersey, right? And, <laughs> and um, so this is a kingdom. So there's a king who's got wives and children and a palace that uh, the father of the king when I was there had created and that uh, eventually UNESCO helped to restore in the 1990s. There were two museums. The father of the king when I was there had created a writing system for his language. He uh, wrote books in his language and created schools or 43 schools throughout the kingdom. <clears throat> this is at the beginning of the 20th century, right? So this was nothing like the misinformation I had been taught about Africa. So then I wanted to know more. And, um, and the family, they were wonderful and they wanted to keep me. <laughs> you know, they did have this son who just, <laughs> <laughs> who was gonna need a wife. And, you know, one moment that was amazingly important, and this kind of harks back to those parties in, um, at Bryn Mawr with the Africans, not the Bryn Mawr parties, but the parties with the Africans. And that uh, my Cameroonian mother one day, cause I was like a daughter in the family, she said that there was gonna be a party. And I thought, oh great, you know, Africans and feathers and animal skins and things and drums. <sighs> no, records, a record player, music from Cuba. Cuba. And so, the, and, and high life, of course, this was Africa. And so the Cameroonians said, well, wait a minute, wait, wait, how come you know how to dance to our dances? And I said, well, because I'm from Jersey, right? <laughs> you know, thanks to being in the aura of the um, Afro-Cuban, Afro-Puerto Rican culture of New York, of course I knew how to dance. And so obviously in the experiment group, there was me as <clears throat> the touch of color and my white compatriots and the Africans were really confused because they were looking at my compatriots and saying, well, now wait, you're we're all listening to the same music and you're doing what we're doing. What are they doing? I, said, I can't account for that. I'm very sorry. Mm -hmm. but <laughs> that led me. So then I went to France and I could study about Africa. There were courses on Africa at the Sorbonne. I could go to Présence Africaine bookstore and, see, and get books on Africa. There were all those Africans. So France was a very African experience for me, African and diasporan. I'm That's how it all started. Let me slow, slow for a minute. <laughs> so, uh, you, 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 you went to Cameroon. Mm -hmm. And um, when you finished your, um, your program in, in Cameroon, uh, you went directly to, uh, to Paris. Yeah, so I spent a summer in Cameroon, two months, just two months. Just a summer? Okay. Just okay. a summer, and then an academic year in France studying political science and anthropology. I thought I wanted to be a diplomat because they got to travel and I'd met some African diplomats. 
Then I met some US diplomats in Yaoundé, capital of Cameroon. I thought, uh, not like that. I asked one man what he thought of Cameroonian food. And Cameroonian food is wonderful and diverse. And it's a very rich country, culturally, agriculturally, culinarily. And this man said, I th he thought he may have had some Cameroonian food. Well, that intrigued me. What did he think he may have had? Some grilled beef. <laughs> but I don't Let think- just, for, for, <laughs> This is interesting because um, I just turned up a copy of a book that actually was the thing that led me uh, to look out into the world. And um, the book, title of the book was The Ugly American. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it was a, um, it was based on fact of basically your, um, Americans living abroad. Um, but the people who were uh, uh, writing the book um, took a critical stance of American behavior um, living abroad mm -hmm. and uh, documented and presented it in, in, in great detail. Well, I read the book in the, it was published, I think around 1960, 61. I, I read the book and it became the reason for me deciding to um, look for a way to go abroad. And the, the way that I found was uh, joining the Peace Corps. And uh, it was the thing that kind of introduced me to that, um, that larger world. And um, in 64, I made my first trip um, out of the United States. And in fact, in 64, I was um, 24 years old. The farthest north I'd ever been was the southern border of Maine. The farthest south I had been was um, Virginia. The farthest east I had been was Atlantic City. And the farthest west was Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Huh. <laughs> I mean, that, that, that was my world at, at, at age 24. But this um, um, learning about the um, behavior of the Americans, I concluded that I could do a better job of representing America than they could. And that I should do that. And at the time I had in, in mind that I was going to go into the foreign service as well, <laughs> which is which is kind of crazy, but go ahead. <laughs> you were, very interesting year. We both went abroad for the first time and got out of this narrow worldview that we had. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think my boundaries were more narrow than yours. Okay. I had been to Harrisburg, New York, as a matter of fact. <laughs> um, but to go, well, when, when the, let's see, I think the, the first week when I was in Cameroon uh, in 1964, that was when the Civil Rights Act was, was um, Mm -hmm. yeah. made real and we became citizens of the country that our ancestors had helped to build and these Cameroonians I lived with they were they they said well do you know Martin Luther King and I said well how do you know about him you know these are Africans right they're not supposed to know about all that they were they embarrassed me so much they knew so much about the world beyond Cameroon so much more than I knew. You know, I tried not to show my ignorance, <laughs> but I said, well, you know, Martin Luther King. And I said, everybody knows him. Oh, <laughs> okay. That's when I learned that other people knew more about the world than we did and all of our arrogance and all of our ugly Americanism. Well, and just like you, right? I thought I joined the foreign service and then I met those foreign service types who were the epitome of the ugly American. Uh, and I thought, oh, no, 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 I don't want to be one of these. Uh, fortunately, I had met an anthropologist in Fumban who was studying the Bamun Kingdom. I thought, yes, this is how I want to travel. I want to travel in the world of the people I'm visiting. I don't want to stand outside and look at them like, hmm. I want to be in there. I want to eat with them. I want to go to their parties and dance with them. And these folks just welcomed me and treated me like a daughter. And I've been back many times since to visit the family in Fumban. And <clears throat> one of the things that I realized was I would just show up at the parents' house. I just show up. I never told them I was coming. And I didn't show up and say, oh, do you have room for me? I just showed up. And they said, there's your room, you know, as if I belonged. And when I went back many years later, the parents were now ancestors, but my siblings had a party and my Cameroonian sister, Florence, 
said, oh, let me show you some photos. She got out the family photo album and I was shocked that I was in the family photo album. And I thought I was a bad uh, correspondent, but I sent like, you know, I got married, sent photos, did this, sent photos, did that. And all those photos were in there with their other children. So I was their African diasporan daughter. Okay. Hmm. <laughs> let me ask you this. So uh, your um, uh, Chinese observations at four notwithstanding, <laughs> what made you decide that anthropology was the um, path for you? Was it the possibilities of travel or uh, what, 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 what was it that uh, got you into the, the field of anthropology? Well, in Fumban, everything started in Fumban. The family invited a French anthropologist to lunch and he was doing research on the Bamun people and he talked about going to various parts of the Bamun kingdom. And I was just in the capital. So, I mean, I went other places, but I didn't really have a sense of the expanse of what we were talking about. And so I thought, yeah, I wanna do what he's doing. I wanna be free to go places and uh, I don't wanna represent a government. Uh, I can't imagine doing that. Um, but I wanna find out what I wanna find out. And uh, so I, my first curiosity was about the, the Bamun kingdom. We traveled throughout Cameroon and I saw all this diversity of phenotypes, for example. You know, we think an African looks like some, something specific. Africans are the most diverse human beings on the planet since they're the most genetically complex human beings on the planet. So I went to places in Cameroon where people spoke to me in their language. I looked like one of them to them. Um, and so wait, that, that was Africa wasn't supposed to be like that, you know, but it was. Um, so then, uh, partially because these Cameroonians had asked me about other places in the Americas, I thought, I learned from them that these other places in the Americas, in the Caribbean, do you know Sparrow from Trinidad? Mm -hmm. Jersey. Mm -hmm. why, why am I supposed to know Sparrow from Trinidad? Everybody knows the Sparrow. The <laughs> Michael Sparrow? <laughs> Well, I did, fortunately, so I, I didn't embarrass us. I didn't embarrass us too much. <laughs> but so they made me curious. I'll just share one other story of, 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 of uh, this kind of cross boundaries. So I'm in, um, in Dakar and we're at this uh, stand at this hotel and every uh, day around three o'clock, this group would come out and um, they'd set up and they'd play. And they basically be, be playing uh, Afro-Cuban music and singing mm -hmm. Afro-Cuban music mm -hmm. and, and singing it in, with, with perfect intonation and diction and everything else uh, of, of, of the Cuban um, um, sound of, the, of these songs. And so uh, about the second day, I decided to get up and go over and have a conversation with them. I speak Spanish, of, of, of course. So I go over and start the Spanish, try to start the Spanish conversation with them. They don't, they can't say, they can't say anything in Spanish. <laughs> they can't say, say a thing in Spanish, but they've learned and mastered these songs in perfect intonation and in perfect um, um, vocabulary. <laughs> and um, I'm sitting there looking kind of dumb. <laughs> I'm, sitting through the, I'm, I'm, I'm running on in Spanish, expecting them to respond. They're looking at me like, I'm, what's wrong with you? I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> and they wonder why you're not talking to them in Wolof. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yeah. absolutely. And, which would bring me to another question. I mean, one of the keys to, in my, my judgment, one of the keys to your success as an anthropologist, um, and to some extent, I think separates you from um, most others that I know is that you are um, fully fluent in four languages, the four languages of the, of the diaspora, basically. Um, the Spanish, the Portuguese, the French, and of course the English. Um, I got the uh, fact that you went to uh, Cameroon and, uh, and then to Paris, and so you picked up the French. Where'd the other two languages come from? <laughs> well, fully fluent is very generous. <laughs> uh, but, you know, I can get by in those languages because I have to. How am I going to talk to the rest of the people in the Americas who look like me if I don't speak those languages? And the fascinating thing for me is that when I'm in those places where 
Portuguese spoken in, is spoken in Brazil and Spanish and the majority of those other countries in the Americas, nobody looks at me and says, oh, you must be a gringa. They speak to me in Portuguese and they say, oh, your Portuguese is funny. What part of Brazil are you from? Mm -hmm. So, you know, I could get by, I have to get by in those languages. And I, Bryn Mawr, fortunately, had an archaic two language requirement. So I had to study Spanish. And if I studied Spanish, well, might as well add Portuguese to it. Um, and I went to, well, and I went to Brazil, to Bahia, to spend two weeks. And they say in Bahia that Bahia and Fechisa, Bahia casts a spell on you. Well, it that does. True. I will testify to that. Yep. The spell works. I, I went for two weeks, I stayed for two weeks and three months. <laughs> <laughs> and I had to get back because I needed my job, right? But um, so I had to speak Portuguese. I didn't have anybody with whom to speak anything else. So I just was immersed in it. And I am so appreciative of speaking those languages because otherwise, you know, people say, oh, well, I get an interpreter. <laughs> that does not work. You need to <clears throat> hear what people say and how they say it. You need to be able to eavesdrop <laughs> if you want to know about the culture. You can't say, oh, it, please, and please translate that into English for me. <sighs> You know, it was actually taken a Portuguese class that I understood the cultural unity of the Black world. I was reading a book called Jubiaba, uh, and I don't know what it's called in English. In French, it's called Le, La Baie de Tous les Saints, the Bay of All Saints. But the hero, Jubiaba, liked to, in, in English, make love with mulattas, jibonca bella, with good hair. When I <laughs> saw those words in Portuguese, I got it. Had I seen them in English, I wouldn't have seen them. You know, we're just. Well, you know, that would just have gone by, of course. Mm -hmm. But seeing that they had the same terminology that we have, I thought, oh, there's a whole lot of stuff that is very similar. And we need to see this because we're told that we're foreigners to each other. That's only if we remain on the superficial level. But my Cameroonian family gave me a just sort of a, an empirical, not ideological, empir empirical, experiential, pan African perspective. And Nicolas Guillen, Afro Cuban poet, said, Sin conocernos, nos reconoceremos. Without knowing each other, we will recognize each other. Well, you recognize each other and then you see the commonalities. And for me, you know, um, going to those churches and seeing them women get happy, the ladies with the hats and the purses who would start jumping around and stuff, getting happy, being filled with the spirit. I didn't understand that in Newark, New Jersey, until I went to a ceremony in Bahia and saw people manifesting the Orishas, the Yoruba spiritual beings, incorporating them. I got it. I saw it. Because I wondered, well, who's the spirit? Where does spirit come from? Why does spirit act like that? Seeing, <laughs> seeing this such similar behavior, you know, a little translation. They had drums. Okay, our drums were prohibited. You don't need drums for rhythm. You know, <laughs> that that organ, that piano, that that the, the, all that body tapping. You know, we got drums. <laughs> so seeing the similarities, seeing the more flagrant Africanity elsewhere in the Americas. I could see ours so much more clearly. And mm. that is. <laughs> yeah. So um, your uh, language, um, let me put it a different way. Um, most anthropologists um, develop their, um, their, their theory, go into the country of, um, of interest uh, and move around uh, either through translators or uh, through whatever facility they have in their language and um, come back and write it up and that becomes anthropology. Um, how did your, if you will, methodology do? <laughs> well, <clears throat> I never wanted to be an office anthropologist doing theory. I wanted to be an anthropologist because it was like Chinatown. I wanted to know what those people were talking about. What were they doing? What did they eat? I wanted to visit them in their homes. And so my, 
I'm still being an anthropologist. A lot of my colleagues you know, are administrators and stuff. No, I'm the one who's going to Ecuador, jumping in the canoe, going to villages only accessible by canoe, or going to Reunion Island in the Indian Ocean, and knowing that in what they call Leo, oh, the highlands, there are what were maroon communities. Reunion Island in the Indian Ocean, we don't learn much about that, similarities. Uh, but like there's one called a, maroon, a former maroon community called Mafat, meaning in Malagasy, fatal. And, uh, <laughs> and I think what that meant was, look, we have escaped from your sugar plantations in the lowlands. Try to come up here and get us. It will be fatal. And so you can get to Mafat in two ways. You can either take a helicopter or you can walk. <laughs> So it's about a four hour walk up the hill, you know, with some little precipices and things. And you think, wow, this is how these folks got up here. Wow. Um, so I want to live anthropology. I am, it, when I, I realize that, you know, when I'm in that canoe, when I'm walking up that hill, I am so thrilled. When I am in that ceremony in mm, Sehu, <laughs> someplace in the state of Minas Gerais in the interior. When I'm visiting Queen Jenga in Rio Grande do Sul in Brazil, I'm thrilled because, you know, I'm really into learning about culture of African origin and how it has recreated itself elsewhere in the world and not just in the Americas, in the world, you know, mm. Reunion Island, being at a ceremony for ancestors on Reunion Island, a service in um, uh, Reunion Creole. Well, that made me want to know, okay, so I've been to an Egun ceremony in Bahia, but those ancestors are generic. In Reunion, that's grandpa. We know him because that was his song and that's how he danced. Well, I want to know in the Americas, what do we have? Because I see myself as an African diasporan with a US passport as an accident of a slave ship. So when I think of Americas, I think, Chile to Canada, from Arica, Chile, to Africville, Nova Scotia in Canada. I consider that that's my territory. Um, so at being at, a at this ancestral ceremony on Reunion Island, I wanted to know, well, what do we have in the Americas like that? The Aguns are not like that in Bahia, um, on the island of Itaparica and, uh, <clears throat> and Salvador. Well, the Garifuna, they're the G a ceremony to which the ancestors come and manifest in the bodies of their and of their descendants, just like on Reunion Island. It took me 20 years to get to a dug. When I learned that they existed as in Dangriga in Belize. And then every time I'd meet a Garifuna after after that, I'd say, Could you take me to a dug? Could you let me know when there's a dug? And they'd all say, Oh, sure. But it's a family thing. I'm not anybody's family. There's no reason for anybody to invite me to one of these things. <laughs> I was in La Ceiba in Honduras doing a workshop for uh, the, an Afro-Honduran um, organization. I heard that there was going to be a dug. <laughs> I harassed everybody until they said, okay, <laughs> okay. And so I, I got there. I had to walk through a, a, a strike, a peasant strike to get there, but I had to get there. And the, the priestess, the, the um, Bouye, welcomed me at the door, blessed me. Welcome me in. And I thought, okay, well, I'll just sit in the corner and watch. No, there is no role for sitting in the corner watching. There is no place to sit and you can't watch. Everybody dances. So for three days, I danced around and around and around with the, <laughs> with the Garifuna for somebody's ancestors. <sighs> I was in it. So, so this is how <laughs> you um, prepared for my introduction to African funerals in Washington. All <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Every time you would come to Washington, I would say, guess what? I have some Cameroonian friends who are having a funeral party. Let's go. <laughs> and we go and we <laughs> you have to come back to to DC and I have to find another Cameroonian friend with a funeral party. <laughs> that, that, that was uh, me. We weren't going with your friend. We, they would tell you where the party was, and we would show up. We didn't know anybody in the, in the in the in the room in the space. Food was everywhere, and music was on. Yeah. And you walk around, and everybody greets you as though they know you. 
Yeah. And um, you know, 15 or 20 minutes into it, you're in the on the floor dancing, and you dance the whole whole night and the whole next day if you want to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and that is so know. rich, you know. And I, th for me, being an anthropologist has given me access to all those different ways that we be <laughs> wherever we be <laughs> and be doing what we be doing. So, so let me say, let me. Uh, poses a positive this um, to the best of my knowledge um, you have probably not only visited but lived in and with more people of African descent in this hemisphere than anybody else I know and that includes Melville Herskovitz and all the rest of the uh, African diasporans. <laughs> uh, is, is, is that, that I, I, I can't think of anybody else who's, who's, who's spent that much time in that many diverse places um, with enough immers almost immer immersive time and experience to come away with um, some substantive knowledge of the particularity of each of the groups and each of the people. Well, I'm missing two countries. I'm missing El Salvador, two continental countries, El Salvador and um, Guyana. But, you know, I'm just curious. And once I know that something is going on, I figure it's my responsibility to go see, because I've got to be able to make these comparisons. And, you know, I think it's really nice to have in-depth knowledge of one place, but I, I really am very curious. I want to know the whole thing. And I want to I, we have learned a European colonial map of the Americas that's manifest in the colonial languages we speak, you know, English, French, Spanish, and those. But I, and so we know that map. We know Ecuador, we know Colombia, we know Martinique. But I see another map. I see that African map of the Americas. It transgresses those colonial boundaries. So I want to know, okay, well, let me look at the Congo map of the Americas, for example. Uh huh. So here we have um, all these places called El Congo in Panama, for example. Here we have people whose last name is Congo in Cali in Colombia. My great grandmother in Delaware, her last name was Congo. Um, in, my, in Minas Gerais in Brazil, they have Mozambique kingdoms and Congo kingdoms. So here we have this whole other kind of map, the Akan map, wherever there's gold, in the Americas, Colombia, Ecuador, um, San Pedro Sula, Honduras, Venezuela, uh, wherever there's gold, there is Congo culture. I mean, a, a, I'm sorry, a con culture, Anansi the spider, that story of uh, the Nancy stories, the Aunt Nancy stories, the Anansio stories. They're all connected with these cultural complexes that are totally separate from that European colonial map that we've been told is the map of the Americas. And so I wanna know that other map, that African map, that map of our connections and our roles in creating the Americas. And you know, when I had that conference in 1996 at the University of Texas, for which I got money from UNESCO, although that was one of the times when the United States was not a part of UNESCO, I got money from the year of tolerance and had a conference on the African diaspora in the modern world. And one of the people I called to invite from someplace, South America, doesn't matter where, said, I'll talk about racism. And I said, no, you won't. That's not what this is about. This is not what somebody did to us. This is about what our ancestors brought from Africa, what they contributed to the creation of the Americas and you know what the Americas would not be were it not for our contributions. And I remember you, Howard, you said something that was revolutionary, changed my whole view on the Americas. You gave the demographics of the Americas. And I, I, I use this all the time. And I say, Howard Dodson said this, of 6.5 million people who crossed the Atlantic Ocean from Africa and Europe to the Americas, 5.5 million people came from Africa. 
one million came from Europe. So for the first 300 of the 500 years of the modern Americas, modern in the sense of post-genocide of the indigenous people due to European diseases and mistreatment that resulted in the demise of 90% of the Native Americans in the first 100 years of the European presence. So that means that Africans were the majority of the human beings who created the basis of all of the Americas. Now that's fundamental. And I didn't know that until decades after I got a PhD. You told me that at a conference I had to organize so I can learn the basis of the culture of the Americas. So once I learned that, first of all, I was mad, right? That although I, got, I had a PhD from the University of Chicago that I was told was the best anthropology department in the country where they tried to teach me that African, US African Americans had no culture and certainly no African roots. So I was mad about that, but then, <laughs> then when you gave me the the, uh, the the demographics, then I'm like, wait a minute, no, 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 no. So you said at that conference, we've got to rewrite not only the story of Africans in the Americas, but the story of the Americas, because how can you leave out the majority of the people who created this place, right? Excellent. Yeah, so I've been about that ever since, but I have to go to those places because no, nobody's gonna tell me about the culture of the people of uh, Playa de Oro in Ecuador, where they have gold still, where they have a story of the, the, the Mamiwata in the Santiago River. And when, when David Ayobi, West African name, was telling me that story after I'd just gotten out of the canoe <laughs> so I could get to Playa de Oro, he was telling me that story and I knew where he was going because I heard that same story by the Congo River when I was in Brazzaville. Mm. So how am I just going to leave that? I got. I have to go and you know learn more. That's my mission. I had a very interesting <laughs> experience, and in, uh, I ended up in P in Peace Corps um, in Ecuador for like two and a half years, organizing credit unions. Um, and one of the places that um, a group of people called who had been trying to organize a credit union called and asked for help with was Esmeraldas. We had a um, we had a re I was running a regional office for the National Credit Union Federation of Ecuador uh, as part of my volunteer experience. And so I, I go to Esmeraldas and I know about Esmeraldas, um, and I'll call it intellectually, that, that it was up there on that corner and <laughs> all part of that. And so I go up and the only way to get there was by, by bus that I had at the time. So I arrived like, 6.30, 7 o'clock at night. And um, I go and check into my hotel and I'm wanting to get something to eat, but I keep hearing these drums playing way, way, way off in the distance. And I went downstairs to a um, um, restaurant and ordered a glass of, I think I could order a beer. I was just sitting there uh, trying to decide what I wanted to order to eat and the drums kept playing. And I finally got up and started following <laughs> the drums and ended up probably about a mile and a half from, um, from the downtown area of the hotel where this whole um, assemblage of people with all of the African musical instruments are playing and people have started dancing. And, and uh, food, of course, is being served there as well. And so my kind of introduction to Esmeraldas was this kind of uh, African welcome. <laughs> with, yeah. With, with the music, with the dancing, with the food, and uh, hanging out with them until God knows <laughs> what, what time that night. Uh, and, and going back nightly uh, whenever there was anything going on. Uh, it, it, it was one of those, you know, absolutely unforgettable experiences <laughs> uh, that I had there. And the, the, the thing that was, uh, in, in retrospect, um, it, it felt like the most African place that I had ever been in uh, until I went to Bahia. <laughs> you know, when I flew into Esmeraldas on one occasion, I um, looked out of the plane and I thought, oh, where am I? This looks just like the estuary 
around Douala in Cameroon. And my, res my thought was the Pacific coast of South America is so much more African the, than the Atlantic coast. And it is, and we don't even think about all those black folks <clears throat> in Ecuador and, and um, particularly like Ecuador and Colombia. Colombia. Mm -hmm. And when you go to those places like Esmeraldas and in, uh, in Colombia, Quibdó, mm -hmm. and you notice that, well, I got out of a plane in Quibdó and Chocó in Colombia and I thought, where am I? Is this Douala or is it Cotonou? Because given the absence of miscegenation <laughs> and given that the Spanish is not exactly the Spanish I learned in college, like where, where in the African world am I? And when I have shown images from Esmeraldas to Africans from any place, the Africans have said, oh yes, this is my country. I recognize these people. And I have said, no, this is South America. And the Africans have said to me, no, you don't know. You're not from Africa. And I have said, right, I'm from Jersey. I've probably been to more parts of Africa than you have. I don't always say that. But let me say that I'm the person who was behind the camera in this place. So I can tell you exactly where this camera was and who these people are. And this is Playa de Oro or Wimby or San Miguel. You know, where this is not Africa. It looks like Africa. <laughs> it really does. And the culture has maintained itself, the marimba. <laughs> which, which brings us to our closing segment on this, which is um, you having traveled to these um, many places of Africa and met its many faces, as you said. Um, what, you, what have you as an anthropologist done with what you've learned? Uh, 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 yes. I, I, I want to uh, just in, introduce it by saying that um, uh, you came to the Schomburg uh, when we opened our scholar in residence program there. You were one of the first two um, fellows in the, in the program, and when you came, your um, project was to organize your slides, your, your photographs, into um, slide presentations so that you could use them to tell the story of the histories and cultures of the diverse people that you had met in that environment. So you can pick it up from there. And that's where it all started. That's where <clears throat> my beginning to show the diaspora began with those slideshows that I did begin at the Schomburg when I was a scholar in residence. And just being in the Schomburg, I remember the first day I walked in there and I felt like the walls exuded my culture. I thought so enveloped in the cultures of Africa and the African diaspora. Um, so that was the beginning. And I, um, obviously <clears throat> my technology evolved from slides to moving images and then the technology kept changing and I kept trying to run after that technology. But I, what I understood was that I didn't have the right to go to these places in Africa and the diaspora that everybody doesn't go to because everybody's not about to climb that hill and reunion or <laughs> jump in that canoe in Ecuador. But I didn't have the right not to bring back those experiences so as to share them. And with, um, with the people. Yeah, with the people. Yeah, with, the, with the people. Which oh, is, yeah, which not is, just that. Yes, thank you very much. Not which, just, which is not a, a traditional anthropological practice. Oh, yeah. I used to get, I mean, my, my anthropological elders, both some African Americans and, of course, the, the white males who taught me to think we didn't have any culture, they were unsuccessful. But I used to get widely criticized for popularizing. I mean, that was a terrible word. You know, you're only supposed to talk to academics. Yet I wrote for Essence Magazine and people read my articles and I got feedback about my Essence Magazine articles. So yeah, my goal has always been from that first trip to Cameroon to share my experiences primarily with African-Americans, you know, sort of the widening circle, African-Americans, other African diasporans, and everybody, because I think it's up to me to help tell the truth. We have been told so many lies about Africa, about us in the Americas. We have no culture. We have no African culture. We didn't contribute anything to the Americas. Give me a break. First of all, Africans contributed humanity to humanity with the first modern human beings who 
evolved in Africa, left Africa, peopled the planet, okay, and then evolved. Um, but so I didn't ever just want to talk to academicians, and I was criticized for that. You know, well, you're not theoretical enough, you're too empirical. Yes, I am. I want to go have those experiences and share them. And I love when we see ourselves in other places and recognize the commonalities, and then we'll well, how does that, how, how, why are they like us? Because, you know, same boat, different stops. Um, and so, um, so I have done academic stuff. I did uh, this conference on the African diaspora in the modern world that I loved. I learned so much there. And, um, well, you can't just have a conference and, and invite people from places where Encyclopedia Britannica tells you they don't exist and where the president of the country tells you don't exist. Like, Argentina, for example. So I invited to the conference in Texas um, people who allegedly didn't exist, Afro-Argentinians, Afro-Uruguayans, Afro-Peruvians, and that couldn't be it. So I had to do a documentary, Scattered Africa, Faces and Voices of the African Diaspora. I had to do a, an academic book, African Roots, American Cultures, Africa and the Creation of the Americas. And to do that book, I had to invent a word to talk about the approach that those people who came to that conference took to the subject matter. My word was Afrogenic, uh, meaning just it comes out of the experience of Africans and African diasporans, our own way of seeing the world through our own eyes, describing it through our own eyes from our point of view as we experience it in our own styles. Um, so I had to do a book, I had to do a film, and that just led me to further explorations. My most <laughs> recent film was the result of the fact that I met a, a woman, uh, Omaima David, who worked at the Rem um, Remember Slavery program at the United Nations. And she said, I want a, docu a documentary on the global African diaspora. And I said, oh, no problem, I'll, I'll, I can do that. I have a lot of video, forgetting I didn't know how to edit. But you know, you can learn. <laughs> and so I began just looking through my hard drives for, for evidence of the African diaspora globally. And this, I have so many stories to tell with all this footage, and it all started with those slideshows way back in the day. So I showed the film, Familiar Faces, Unexpected Places, a global African diaspora at the United Nations as their um, Black History Month program in 1998 for the United Nations International Decade for People of African Descent. And I was really pleased when the Remember Slavery Program sent the film around the world to their UN information centers in the Americas and Africa and Europe and Asia and the Pacific. So this film that I did based on the stuff I had accumulated, the images I accum accumulated in my wanderings, edited in my rather simplistic manner, but you know, it's, I think the story needs to be told in a straightforward way. And I love the kinds of reactions I've gotten from people. I had a friend from um, Mali who <laughs> looked at the person in the Americas who's got my favorite name, um, Juan Angola Maconde from Bolivia, who when I met him said, I'm Juan Angola Maconde from Bolivia. We have no African culture. And I said, Angola Maconde, <laughs> you have two African names and no African culture, how is that? Well, so my friend Bas from Mali looks at Juan Angola Maconde and says, oh, Bolivia? And so that's the kind of reaction I've gotten to not just Bolivia, obvious places like Paraguay, but also Turkey, three totally separate African descendant communities in India. You know, this is all just, I just consider this real. And, um, and so I just love sharing this vision of the world with everybody. And it is so empowering for us who have been told that we have no culture. Well, that's just a lie. And so um, <laughs> my mission is to help tell the truth. Carter G. Woodson published his book in 1933. Carter G. Woodson who created uh, Black History Week that became Black History Month. It was Negro History Week. Um, he published The Miseducation of the Negro in 1933. Well, you can't miseducate the Negro and educate everybody else properly. So this story that I'm telling, this is not just a Negro story or an African descendant story. This is a global story. You know, these African descendants have contributed to every place. I mean, the whole issue of 
independence movements, well, in Iraq, in the area of Basra. <laughs> and was it the ninth century? Africans who were taken there to clear the swamps in Southern Iraq revolted and created an independent, what we would now call maroon community, uh, Al Muqtada, that lasted for 15 years, I believe. So we need to know our story, not just in the United States. You know, we've been told, uh, and we have unfortunately believed too much that this is like planet USA, unconnected with the rest of the world, or at least the center of the world. We need to know in order to understand ourselves that we're not the majority of the African diaspora. Some people talk about us and the diaspora. We're part of it, but we're not the majority. Brazil has more than a hundred million Afro-Brazilians, the first language of the African diaspora is Portuguese. And it is so enriching, so empowering for us to have a sense of us as a global people. When you think of all the culture, the fascinating culture that wouldn't exist in the Americas without Africans and African descendants, that's really rich. Yes, it is. <laughs> that's probably a, a good place for us to conclude this because it is rich. And um, though um, in 2021, we know a hell of a lot more about it and about our relationship to the various parts of it than we did uh, a century ago. Um, what we know is still surface. We're still learning uh, both what the particularity of, the, of each peoples from the continent has been to the particular places that they've arrived in. And we still need to know, um, um, we actually need to know um, the ways in which um, what's been happening in the last 50 plus years, this uh, period of um, global migration of African peoples that uh, really had not been possible and voluntary migration for the most mm -hmm. part. Uh, where it has gone and what kind of impact it has had on the various places that the people have come. So there, there's a, um, a, a kind of, um, if you will, root um, culture that people of African descent have created in actually around the globe, as you say. Um, but new cultures and new, um, experience, just one example, um, the largest, um, basically Brooklyn has the largest black population, <laughs> has a larger black population than I think still any other, place, certainly in the Western Hemisphere. <laughs> and uh, it's so diverse um, with so many different, uh, African people speaking different languages and practicing different musics and all the rest of that. While simultaneously they're finding people there are finding each other and finding points of commonality and creating new music, new dances, new art, um, new products of their creativity. And so um, I, I, I think the um, certainly important for people listening to you and seeing this piece that they um, recognize the fact that it's a, um, a, a, a new old, it's a new old world <laughs> that they're uh, living in and um, frankly have a responsibility to know more about it. Um, so that it and its, um, uh, its legacies can be, uh, properly recognized and uh, embraced as a part of our shared lived experience. So I, I thank you for um, your contributions to the, that awakening, uh, Ms. Uh, Dr. Walker. <laughs> well, thank you very much. And I'm really pleased that there is more to discover. My map of the world is the map that 
African-American historian Joseph Harris, father of African diaspora and studies, published in about 1980, where he has all those arrows going out of Africa to all these places in the world. And my goal is to follow all those arrows okay. and recognize that we, African, African descendants in the Americas, it's we who made this new world new. Okay. Um, new world Africans, here we come. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, um, African Film Festival. Thank you. <laughs>